Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. This is Elizabeth Townsend Gard, your host, and I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School and a faculty fellow at the A.B. Friedman School of Business at Tulane. And I just want a quilt. So today we have Joe Cunningham chatting with us. He is a super famous art quilter, and we are beyond excited that he's here. So he's going to talk to us about that and also about taking paintings and cutting them, cutting them up and putting them into quilts. Hi, my name's Joe Cunningham. I'm calling from my studio in San Francisco, California. Awesome. And what's your first memory of someone, I think I know the answer to this from watching videos, but what's your first uh, memory of someone sewing or quilting in your life? Um, my very first memory of someone quilting is uh, when I was a little boy, my mom uh, would borrow, we lived on a dirt road, right by a cornfield uh, outside of Flint, Michigan, and my mom uh, would borrow the quilt frame from uh, some neighbor person, I don't know who uh, uh, had a quilt frame. Anyway, you know, just four legs and four sticks. And uh, she would buy sheeting, uh, which was, you know, you could buy by the yard. And I don't know how wide, let's say 96 inches wide or so. And down in the basement would install a uh, uh, half of the sheeting in the quilt frame and then some kind of batting on top of it and then would fold the other half over and uh, tie it with yarn oh, and uh yeah and then that way she could make a quilt you know i mean a tied comforter um yeah. really fast That's really interesting. Uh, and, yeah you know two or three a day and then that way uh and i think i would help i'm not positive about this and she's gone now i can't check it with her but uh and then she would put a binding around the edge so that really has colored my thinking uh a lot about quilts and we'll probably get into that in what way? In what way did it color your thinking? Well, the way it colored my thinking is that um, uh, it, it showed me, uh, as soon as I started making quilts, it showed me that uh, making uh, a piecing or appliquing a quilt is a dumb way to make a blanket. Yeah. Uh, it, it takes a long time. It takes it's a, a lot of time. labor. Right. And so then I had to start thinking about, uh, well, why would anybody do such a dumb thing? Yeah. And that led me down all kinds of uh, uh, avenues of thought that I would not have uh, uh, encountered otherwise, probably. Do you think there is a place for that kind of quilting that we, you know, that's always sort of people kind of look down upon quilts that are tied. Mm -hmm. But I remember my first quilt was tied. Like, is there a place Ah. for that within our community and we don't really talk about it as much? Uh, Well, yeah, I I think that I think there is a place for it. And and there are uh, uh, there's things that are left over from uh, uh, the 1970s revival ideas about quilts that have persisted even into the modern quilt uh, movement, modern quilt age. And uh, that's one of them, is that uh, tying is a poor cousin to yeah. quilting. So interesting, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah. I hadn't really thought about that. So many of the things I've seen, you, that the, the quilt frame plays an important part of your life, I think. Um, yeah. Does it, tell me why and sort of, how should we be thinking about the quilt frame? And when I talk about quilt frame, that's a hand quilting frame. That's not like long. I mean, you have a long arm and you do that too. But yeah. but there, yeah. a lot of your time and, and um, a lot of the things I saw were you hand quilting on the frame. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was the first thing that I learned how to do in 1979 uh, when I was, uh, oh, golly, Gwen Marson asked me to participate with her on this documentation project of Mary Schaefer's quilt collection. Anyway, uh, in order to write persuasively about quilts, uh, she thought I should learn how to quilt. And so she uh, taught me the rocking stitch that she had learned from Mennonite women in Oregon. Anyway, uh, I learned the rocking stitch 
Uh, and then pretty soon, in a week or so, after I started quilting, I, I quilted a lot that first week, and then uh, my stitches were, well, were good enough that I could quilt with Gwen at her frame. And then we started making quilts together, which we did for 10 or 11 years. Um, so uh, uh, it was the first thing that I learned how to do before I learned how to piece or applique, before I learned the glories of, uh, it, it, so it's sort of backwards uh, yeah. to, w- to the way most people learn. Most people think about the color design first, you know, what am I, what's the image that I'm creating here? And for me, I started thinking about, well, what's the quilting design? Uh, how am I going to quilt this thing? And so my aesthetic <laughs> early on was sort of uh, all about how I could um, uh, throw something together so I could get it in the frame. Yeah, <laughs> that, that was the thing. And, and, yeah, I get that. And get to the fun part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I uh, get that. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, and then as uh, hand quilting went into decline, as the, with the rise of first domestic machine quilting and then long arm quilting and then the entire machine quilting industry. Uh, um, uh, blah, 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 blah. Wow. It made me think about this a lot. So uh, if I can just go back for, can, can I just keep talking? Yeah, you totally can keep talking. I'll keep interrupting <laughs> if you're okay with that. Yeah. That's excellent. Okay. Uh, so, so what it made me, what it has made me think about, is uh, it, uh, hand quilting at a frame, especially, has gotten this uh, 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 sort of reputation for being just a vast amount of drudgery that you would have to go through. Here I have my beautiful, completed artistic statement that I made with my color design, uh, and now it's this big thing I have to slosh through to yeah. get from here to my finished quilt, you know, and oh, I'm just going to pay somebody to do it. Right. Or what's the quickest way I can do it, or whatever, right. and it, it gives the idea that hand quilting is drudgery, uh, which I know from personal experience it is not. It is the opposite of drudgery. It is uh, uh, it, it, when you know how to quilt and if you have good techniques, so that it, there's nothing hard about it. It's the easiest work that ever got created. You're sitting down and you're doing this very easy thing that keeps a little part of your mind occupied. So the rest of your mind can soar freely throughout the universe. (laughs) So that uh, people often will say that it's like meditation. I maintain that it's not, that it is meditation. It's not (laughs) like meditation. It's exactly the same thing. And so I can get up after hand quilting for four or five hours or six hours or whatever, maybe seven hours with a lunch break in there and feel refreshed, not feel uh, uh, all beat up or anything. I feel great and so uh it made me think about well what you know what is this all about in the quilt world and uh uh if you picture a woman uh and her world and her life around 1800 when the quilting craze just started to hit in the states and the former colonies when the quilt increased, you know, 1790, 1800 or so, when it was just starting to take off with the rise of cotton, which is a whole other uh, subject, but um, it was just starting to take off. Uh, what was a woman's life like? Oh, it was easy. You know, all she had to do was everything all the time, right? Like make the babies, raise the kids, uh, re- uh, deal with the garden, raising the food, preparing the food, dealing with all the clothes, de- dealing with the entire domestic sphere to which she was confined by law and custom, right? Yeah. So, uh, and there was this idea that a woman had to stay busy at all times. So, you know, idle hands, the devil's uh, tools, and all that sort of idea. So uh, uh, it was hard, man. And, and the relief from it was what? Well, um, they couldn't participate in civic life. They couldn't participate in, uh, uh, you know, it, it, as an officer in the church, could not, uh, could not follow professions for the most part, uh, especially you couldn't follow an artistic profession. Uh, uh, for the most part, uh, uh, women worked, and very often, in isolation. Now, of course, there was women that lived in town and had servants and so on, but I'm talking about those servants uh, uh, and slaves. That uh, there was, so that life for a woman, in general, for most women, around... Uh, 1800 was hard and it was isolated 
uh, and very often geographically isolated, so that uh, uh, women had o- only their own kids and their husbands for uh, companionship, and uh, didn't weren't able to have much social intercourse with other women. Along comes this craze, this uh, this uh, fashion for quilted bed coverings. Well, like I said earlier, it, uh, it, that's a dumb way to make a blanket. It takes forever. And uh, to, relatively speaking, in the chores department, it takes forever. You have to sit there for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> you sit still. Right. At this it's, frame it's a relief. It's, while, it's a space. And, and, yeah. and while you're meditating, right. your, no, the it's creative really part of your mind is just, right? Yeah. And uh, so what, what, so the kinds of quilts that we inherited from our European fair for fair bear uh were um it was it was not patterns so much as strategies right yeah. there was a whole cloth quilt you could yeah. just get some lengths of uh, cotton if you could afford it you know you had to be well to do uh and and quilt that there was strippy quilts which were just strips of uh fabric there was uh medallion quilts which we interpreted as broderie purse or which we picked up on his broadery purse and uh that was you know something in the middle with a series of borders uh there was a hexagon quilt um these these were strategies you know they weren't yeah. patterned right yeah uh that's what we inherited well uh if you think about um those kind of quilts even a whole cloth quilt i myself can quilt one in a few days uh i mean just simple grid quilting you know uh in a few days for a whole cloth quilt um, but, uh, and, 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 uh, for very fancy quilts, you know, it's, it's going to take much longer to quilt. So interesting, but isn't it? What American women did was they, uh, came up with what by 1840 or 1850, you have hundreds of thousands of patterns and variations of those patterns, uh, right. This big bang of creativity and the patterns didn't get simpler, <laughs> you know, yeah. they got ever more complex. They didn't get more complex because women had to make blankets they got more complex because women enjoyed the work and also they got to sit around a frame sometimes at least uh with other women so bingo we got other women uh to have companionship with we have the easiest work that ever got created and uh uh and you're making a blanket so that the man can't prevent you from doing it right can't it prevent you from going over That's to right. miss lizzie's house and so for the quilting yes. the, it looks right? like you're just doing so, your work. Where do you? You're think, doing your work. So interesting. Where do you think your love of history um, comes from? Well, uh, when I got started, <clears throat> excuse me, my mentors, uh, Gwen Marson, but especially Mary Schaefer, <clears throat> excuse me, who was born in uh, 1910 uh, and started making quilts in uh, the 40s, uh, Mary's idea. Uh, for what you had to do to become a quilter was uh, you had to become a historian of quilts. You had to become a historian of textiles. You had to be an engineer. You had to be an artist. You had to be a technician. You had to learn all the different techniques. And she was very stern. So for a couple of years, it was like going through an apprenticeship, uh, having Mary for a a guide and a mentor. And uh, also, uh, I had just finished my what turned out to be my only year of college when I ran into quilts. I was 26 years old, and I went to college finally just for one year, and I realized, well, this is where you belong, Joe. I've always been very bookish, and uh, I had not gone to college because I thought, they can't teach me how to rock and roll. Uh-huh. I'm a guitar player, <laughs> man. Right. What would I – I didn't know anybody that went to college, you know? Uh, and so, anyway – uh, uh, and uh, so I get to college and I realize, oh my God, this is what, this is, I, this is where I belong. This is uh-huh. where I should have been all along. So then I didn't go back the next year once I discovered quilts and got a job writing this, uh, uh catalog and then decided to make quilting my, uh, life. So interesting. And, um, I thought, Joe, you're going to give yourself the college education in quilts that you didn't give yourself in, uh, in really cool. uh, otherwise, you know? So interesting. So, that, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, it's interesting that a lot of the, the quilt historians I'm seeing, they're not formally trained, you're not formally trained, but there's a, right. and I'm, I'm a formally trained, that's what I went, I had to have yeah. a PhD in cultural history, but it's an interesting thing because you are 
professionally trained, right? It's just you did it in the old fashioned way, as you said, with a mentor and I mm-hmm. mean um, it's careful. Yeah. It's you know, you're a historian. I mean that's you know, it isn't I don't know, it's yeah. very interesting and that we haven't produced like it, it was just a different path. And that's true of like I think yeah. about Barbara Brackman, I think about all these people like none yeah. of them are like, well, I went to a PhD program to get a, a PhD in yeah. quilt, right? Like that's not what's happening. I'm yeah. interested to see. Do you see right. as after the revival, do you see any kind of like I want to go to a top program? I, I mean, I know we have quilting. We have Nebraska and we have a few other spaces for quilting. Yeah. But yeah. Do you think historians yeah. still stay outside of that traditional like a quilt historian still outside of a traditional path for historians or has that shifted over time well uh i think mostly they are outside um the the role of uh, the the place of quilts in american society is uh uh it's peculiar and it's it's very limited um i wonder what to compare it to uh anyway uh since quilts were extra academic, right? There was no yeah. academy yeah. Uh, for quilt making. That meant that uh, women were free to invent this whole tradition any way they wanted. They created it the way they wanted. Uh, um, and so, uh, but anyway, they were not, uh, they were just excluded from any intellectual consideration. So, in the 20th century, okay. uh, there was a few historians, you know, Ruth Finley and Dr. Mm-hmm. Dudson and all these. Uh, um, there, there, there was a little bit of history go, uh, that started to happen. But in the 70s, when um, women started looking for their own history and realizing, well, here we have this treasure trove of fabric documents, mm-hmm. uh, um, then th- uh, that appealed to a certain number of women who uh, took up this study of history uh, of quilt history and you know uh have this there's it's a very small group though i mean if you go to the american quilt study group which is where all the historians meet right we're talking about a few a few hundred uh, right. uh, members right i, yeah. I mean I, I could be wrong about that but i don't yeah. know the the membership but it's a very small number and it's an aging aging population of historians so there's and there's very few young ones coming into the business in, into the into this line of study and i think that's primarily because um uh when we, when this revival started in the 70s, it was associated <clears throat> with history. It was associated right. with the bicentennial, right. the rediscovery of American craft, the discovery of uh, women's history, and uh, and so on. <clears throat> and our mission, as the people who started in the 70s, I started late in the 70s, 79, but uh, I think of myself as part of that generation. Um, the the Our mission was to get quilts valued, was to get to people somehow to acknowledge the significance of quilts and that they had inherent value. So they should be preserved, they should be studied, and, and so on. And so to that end, we built our own museums because we were not taken seriously in other museums. Yeah. We had to build quilt museums. We had to have shows. We had to have our own publications because there's no interest in quilt history outside of the world of quilts. Well, anyway, we built all of that stuff. So and interesting. And so now the young the young people coming along, uh, well, that was their mom's mission. Right. Uh, that, that was that's not their mission. So it's 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 explicitly stated, at least it was the last time I checked in the uh, uh, modern quilt manifestos. It, it's explicitly stated that we're making quilts to be used and uh, to be new. You know, right. the, uh, turning away from history. So the modern movement is so far has been ahistorical. It's right. been not really a- opposed to history, but um, with a fundamentally different uh, quilt. We, uh, quilts are already valued. They, they want them to be less valued, yeah. <laughs> according to what I read. There. No, we're making quilts to be used. They should be something cute to put on the bed. Right. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? And then that combined with yeah. sort of our hyper-capitalism of sort of the world that we live in um, creates yeah. a really interesting ahistorical space of people doing a lot of stuff. Um, which is so interesting, and that's why um, your work with um, your your video on G's Bend is really interesting, and sort mm-hmm. of thinking back to the quilt frame, all this stuff. I mean, you do yeah. so many interesting things, but you your work is so um, 
cool and interesting and fun and at the same time um there's there's deeper meaning and there's all kinds of things going on it's just really um really cool i'm really excited to be talking with you now okay (laughs) so we got to the first Um, question i just want you to know like when i say like we might need to have a part two that was the first uh my that was the first topic the quilt (laughs) frame Um, i have like 15 of them so the one thing i've learned about you in in doing research is that you are really have great quotes you should be writing like the quote book of Joe Cunningham because <laughs> you come up with these things that are just like perfect. So um, I've written down some of them, and I thought maybe we talk about we could ha- we could frame the interview around these these some of these things. And as I said, we are so not going to get to this whole list. Um, I love first of all we don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but I loved your um, cutting up of the uh, the canvases. Um, to make quilts uh-huh. because people are cutting up quilts to make art. I loved that. I right. loved that. That oh. just and and the stuff you made was so gorgeous. It was like, <laughs> I mean, it was really it was fun and and daring. That first swipe through that canvas was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so yeah, it was great. It was really. Good. I want to get quote, back to but, that series. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I've made uh, two quilts with cut up canvases. And I've been saving canvases. People have given me canvases. And, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to do more of that. I want to, uh, uh, I, I do want to make a whole series of quilts from cut up canvases so cool. because, uh, this, this idea doesn't go away. I, and I'm so infuriated by this Calvin Klein, yes, uh, right. uh, use of, um, uh, a, a perfectly fine quilt. So in case people uh, you know, don't know, thing... let me let me just pause you. In case people are listening and yeah. they don't know what you're talking about, can you quickly explain um, what happened yeah. in that situation? Yeah, what you can do is you can go to the Calvin Klein website, CK dot whatever it is. But, you know, just, just Google Calvin Klein and you'll find it. And on their website, they have, uh, oh, there's men's collection, women's collection. There's uh, uh, home uh, collection and there's bedding under that. Uh, and so uh, when you go to the bedding, You'll see there are things that are printed versions of pieced quilts, but you also will see pieced quilts. Uh, that, and there's a story uh, buried deep in their website about how they acquired a few thousand quilts. They sent their team around the country and bought a lot of quilts. You, you know, the market in antique quilts is so down, there's nobody buying them. So they, they were able to buy these things very cheaply. And uh, um, and they just to use them as a symbol of of american ingenuity or something i forget their verbiage exactly and then they took those quilts and they cut them up and they used them for upholstery on chairs they used them for the lining of parkas they used them for uh, supposedly elegant uh uh ladies fashions uh, in fashionable coats and stuff so um uh all that is they they did whatever they did but then the advertising for it is so shockingly uh, disrespectful <laughs> in every possible way. For instance, they use quilts on the floor of the barn, and then they have a bunch of male models stand on the quilts with their boots. Right. They're, they're, they're using the quilts as, you know, to protect the soles of right. their boots. Right. They, they, they will put a whole, uh, a, a whole uh, cadre of Kardashians Yes. Uh, with nearly bare asses on their, uh, uh, on their quilts. And somehow the quilts are supposed to lend an air of authenticity or some, I, I can't even comprehend what they, uh, talk about in their verbiage about this. Right. And, uh, it's, it's so, uh, insulting, uh, uh, to the quilts. I mean, right now on their website, there's, uh, a couple of quilts that are beautiful piece quilts. You can tell that they're in first rate condition. Yeah. That, and I'm sure they bought them for a hundred or two hundred dollars and then embroidered in six inch high letters across in like two or three foot wide sentences, uh, conceived in New York, designed by Calvin Klein. Really? Uh, made in America. Yeah. You can check it out. It's right there. That and is it's totally insane. In, uh, under the, the bedding. It's absolutely insane. And it's in, and, uh, and guess what? They're having trouble selling them. Apparently, they're marked at thirty-eight hundred dollars. Uh, this quilt that an anonymous person made, that they then took. they're trying to brand by insulting the and, and ruining the <clears throat> the entire design by embroidering right across it, as if the design means nothing. 
Um, and it looks like and, they have, and, and, I don't really understand. There's a site on their vintage quilts. They have vintage quilts that are very expensive. Um, but then yeah. they put black stuff on top of it. Have you seen those? It's really weird. That black stuff on top of it is what I'm talking about. That's the embroidered uh, messages. If you expand it, you can see uh, that it says something like conceived in America, designed in New York by Calvin Klein and with the 2018 insane. or something like that. Why That's the black do... stuff on top of it. It's really weird, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. so odd. Right. So you so, feel like and, and, that... Yeah. That's disrespecting the quilt is what you're saying is that you so with the art pieces, what you were saying is that like, don't just like it's going back to that kind of not valuing that the whole value message yeah. that was coming out of Bicentennial. You're saying that we still right. need to, that message has not been heard loud and people are not understanding. They wouldn't do it with a painting. And that's that's sort of your that's right. your message. Oh, my goodness. I have this. uh <clears throat> Sometimes I'm lying in bed at night and I'm playing out the scene in the courtroom uh, where I'm arguing my own case before the judge. And I'm saying to the judge, Your Honor, what is the difference between an artist who puts colors on the canvas in an arrangement that the artist conceives of and executes and the quilt? where the quilt maker has cut up pieces of fabric and arranged them in a way that she conceived of. Yeah. What's the fundamental difference between those things, Your Honor? Right. And the, the judge always has to say that I won the case. I yeah. win every single time, Elizabeth. Well, it's so interesting yeah. because what you're talking about <laughs> is moral rights, right? Right of attribution, right of integrity, um, things that yeah. we have for a very small subset of works that happen. You have They have to be after 1990, all this ridiculous stuff in the U.S. But around the world... You know, if you're in France, yeah. moral rights apply, are perpetual. So the yeah. it seems like that right of integrity, if you're, again, in France, would cover what you're mm -hmm. concerned about, which is sort of, you know, yeah. the, the um, maybe degradation or like yeah. not respecting the quilt. Um, if it was, con you know, if it, so, <clears throat> yeah. Well, and I, I could even handle the, the not respecting the quilts if they did not discuss it if you read the Calvin it's Klein the verbiage with this, yeah. the way they talk about yeah. it, they are honoring these, these quilts by cutting them up and using them for jacket linings and stuff. Yeah. And uh, and it's such bullshit. Yeah. It, it's so, uh, uh, and, it's, and, and plus it's insulting. And, and, you know, furthermore, it just points out um, the, the culture wide <laughs> shallow thinking yeah. about quilts because yeah. quilts, I mean, when you say the word quilt, uh, people picture a grandmother right. uh, making this quilt for somebody. Well, there, nothing could be more, uh, uh, nothing could be less worthy of attention and especially serious attention in our culture than a little old lady. When you say little old lady, it's so it's like the worst. Yeah. It's kind of, it is, it, it's, it's it, like, yeah, it's really interesting. It's the, you know, the whole like, um, discounting, like it's discounting an entire industry. Yeah. And it also has got a second yeah. layer of discounting women of a certain age. Like it's a double whammy mm -hmm. of, um, That's right. and I had that with, um, somebody very high up at the university when I was trying to explain this project, his response was yeah, like, right. well, why would we support, you know, grandmother's quilting? And it was like, well... Grandmother's quilt. Bingo. Right? I was like, well, first of all, like, you know, this is not... <laughs> I was like, okay, really? <laughs> Do you really want to go down that path? Like, okay, here I go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, oh, it wasn't right. good. It was not a good moment. And I don't even think right. that people feel like... I mean, it's like... It's like the racial slurs of yesteryear. You know, there's a sense of like, they don't think they're even saying anything wrong. That's the part that's, no, that's so right. interesting to me. They're just like, well, you know, it's just, it's interesting to see. Um, yeah. Is, yeah, that's the assumption that you can make. This is, it's something done by little old ladies. It's not worth studying. And, and, and uh, um, it, it, it goes along with this whole idea, like what you mentioned the G's Ben people. Yeah. You know, when people talk about them, it's like they're blind and stupid. Right. They, uh, they uh, like, well, they were just picking up anything they could find off the ground right. and just sewing it together. Anyway, it's so insulting and yeah. denigrating that, that this idea that a woman could pursue this, 
excuse me. One of the things about 19th century quilts is that, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I'm not going to back up that far, but, but one of the things is that uh, uh, a, a woman could take up quilt making and pursue it and have a career. Yeah. Now, my wife uh, begs to differ with me. Did they get paid? No, they did not get paid. That was part of the brilliance of making quilts gifts was that men would stay out of it and it could be a woman's world. Yeah. But she could pursue it as seriously, intellectually and artistically seriously as she wanted for her entire life. Yeah. So here's this, this little old lady we're talking about has been doing this thing, perhaps seriously, for 50 years. Right, and, and longer, you think right? That I mean, they start... I mean, and longer. Right. And yeah. you think that she doesn't know what she's doing? Yeah. That she's blind and stupid? Yeah. That, she does, that every single fabric that she sews onto every single other thing is not deliberate? Yeah. What do you... Ugh, it's so... Ugh. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting because we... Deliberate and artistic. Yeah, mm-hmm. we had the G's... Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a G's Ben workshop and had some of the women come down... I think about a week ago yeah. um, as part oh, of China. the whole space. And it was, uh, I was really, um, really moved by the piece that you did. I found that it was very um, respectful um, and mm-hmm. um, treated them like the artists that they are. And as you said, they've been kind of commercialized in a funny way to be kind of almost mm-hmm. characters that you have to go, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's weird what's happened to them. I mean, I think it's, you know, economically great um but i would i wish that there yeah. was more of the message of what you were saying i remember when you were we found in this video i've posted the a video of the lot we'll have it on our website but the um when you see okay. her uh the white whole cloth of and it's just gorgeous oh. and you're like completely yeah. stunned by the work and um yeah. and it's just like you you in that that video that you did you it's it's respectful it's artist to artist talking um, it's really just one of the best pieces I've seen on them um, that didn't put uh, them into kind of a hokey, country, ridiculous kind of not respecting what they do, you know? Yeah. Oh, well, thanks. I, I, I was very – what happened, you know, was that the producers of Craft in America uh, got in touch with me and asked me if I wanted to be, in the, be featured. And I said, yeah, absolutely. Well, what do you want to do? And that was the first thing that I thought of is, well, I want to meet the video crew in G's Bend uh, – and uh, quilt with those women th- that uh, my, these friends of mine, because um, the, uh, that is the closest link I'm ever going to have to the 19th century yeah. is quilting with these women who learned when they were girls, when they were young girls from their mothers and grandmothers. Uh, and they're using frames that their great grandfathers made, you know, yeah. and uh, they're using techniques that are completely uh, their own and their uh, anyway uh, uh, that's what I want to do and um, it, and not to and, and, to, and to treat them like fellow quilters yeah. I mean that, that's just what we are that's right. the, uh, and, and fellow yeah, artists right. I mean the, the work is fellow so artists. incredible yeah. and you have the, in this mm-hmm. video you have your work um, juxtaposed with their work um, and it's just like mm-hmm. stunning I mean they're all stunning right uh, there it's like Okay, this is these are all incredible. Okay, so let me go back to see we're not we're still we're not we're not getting very far. But we're having a great time and we're learning a lot. So it's okay. So here's the quote from the uh, the bed after Rauschenberg. That's the quilts that you did where you paint took painted canvases yeah. and cut it up because uh, okay. And you said, I'm not doing it for anyone else, just for myself. And then later in the video you say, To me, the last thing I'm interested in is what the quilt looks like. Um I'm yeah, wondering right. Is that true all of the time, or was it just true in that instance? Like, how much are you just sort of immersed in the love of the art for you and whatever comes of it later is whatever it is? And then also, how much do you care of what it looks like when you're in the process of, like, tell me a little bit more about that. Well, um, so the way I make a quilt is I think of a subject that I want to pursue, that I want that, that, that I, I think of what the quilt is going to be about. It's sort of like a poem or something, you know, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to create this thing that uh, that's like an embodiment of this idea. Yeah. And I generally have a, uh, um, a, a, a vague idea. Well, I'm going to start, like this 
Yeah. And I'm going to then start, and that gives me something to start with. So then I can cut two pieces of fabric up uh, and start sewing things together. And then I uh, have learned over the last 15 years or so, as I've started doing this kind of work, that uh, um, when I'm in the middle of cutting and sewing is when the image starts to come together for me. And I see, oh, this is where I'm going. And then I can throw my whole self into it. Yeah. Um, so it's a little scary uh, to start cutting and sewing and not know, I call it sewing without knowing. That's really cool. Uh, not know uh, what it's going to look like at the end, yeah. you know. And But I also feel like I've been doing this for 40 years. Right. If know, I don't have instincts right. it's pretty, right. it's, by it, now. It's a sophisticated not knowing. It's not like, well, I don't know. <laughs> Right. You've done it so much and right. you have a sense of sort of the structure and composition and all the things that right. you're looking at that you're sort right. of jumping in is a little bit different than a beginner's jumping in. Although improv quilting and all kinds of art quilting is, is very much a, a thing mm-hmm. at the moment. But but yours is a bit different because yeah. you do have a lot. It's it's like the G's Ben women like they they make these things and you're like, yeah. That is incredible, and you try to do it, and it's good, yeah. but it's it, there's something different about it. Like, there's a, yeah. I don't know. For me, when I see their yeah. work and we saw it in person, mm-hmm. it's just like you're just like, you're just kind of blown away by it, you know? There's something yeah. there that's more than just the quilting, you know? Um, yeah. Well, I, uh, I happen to think that, uh, I, I, that what we make, you know, is, is an expression of, our being totally. <laughs> our humanity I agree. and that's what i'm looking for always is uh, you would be is, uh, um, the individuality yeah mm-hmm. so i think you would be a bit a very great french artist because the french the copyright law in france is based on mm-hmm. ours is utilitarian u.s is utilitarian so is british right but the french come from mm-hmm. it from a very different perspective which is um a, a uh, natural rights i've created this this is my thing this is who i am and so we need to protect yeah. it because it is my being it is who i am and therefore the laws yeah. now the laws look pretty much the same but it comes from a very different perspective versus utilitarian yeah. like how am i going to sell this um and so yeah. you would be very good at uh, you, yeah you, you you belong in that camp <laughs> you know i'm going to learn french totally. by golly uh, at least French uh, copyright move. law. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, okay, let me give well, you the, another the, one. Uh, the other thing, yeah, go the ahead. other thing about uh, where my work comes from yeah. that I just want to say, you know, is that uh, uh, my whole life, I, I was told in high school that I had no talent for art, even though I liked to draw and stuff. I was not very good at it. And my art teacher explained to me that I was not very good at it. Uh, and even in high school, what I really, really liked was art history. And I was a musician, so I didn't care if I don't if I don't get to make art. Yeah. If I'm not good at that, I, I'm an artist in my own way. I play yeah. guitar, you know. Right. And so uh, the heck with it. And I didn't have any aspiration to be uh, a visual artist. But that's all I cared about was art. So uh, uh, I would. I, I mean, in high school, I would skip school to go to the Detroit Institute of Arts. Uh, um, because you could have it all by yourself uh, on a, a weekday, mm-hmm. and, and because I loved it, because I I, I would just mm-hmm. and and the Flint Institute of Arts, which had actually uh, cool stuff. Um, I just looked at art all the time. I read biographies yeah. of artists. I read criticism that I didn't understand, and uh, uh, and uh, theory about art. So I just studied art my whole life, and um, so I, I'm. I never went to art school. There's many things that I don't know. But what I do know is that I've studied art my whole life and I continue to and uh, continue to look at paintings all the time. Many people, it seems to me, want to make uh, um, uh, art quilts that that don't look around at what art looks like. Uh, And so they make... uh, uh, So... My, I, I'm not. So what I'm trying to do with my quilts, I'm trying to make something that looks like I'm, it would belong on the wall of a museum. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm. I, I'm not interested in comparing myself yeah. to art quilters. I'm. I'm. In, I'm. Just I'm interested things. in comparing myself to the artists yeah. that are out there in museums. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's very cool. Your stuff is so cool. Okay, so we talked about hand quilting. You talked about hand quilting in silence, and you said, it makes me feel wealthy. wealthy. It makes me feel like the luckiest guy in the world. And we've talked about that because it's got that meditative mm-hmm. space, and, and it's just like it's, yeah. it's your space of kind of um, keeping it, you know, getting back to a good space. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's really interesting. Yeah. I'm going to ask a really practical question. If people are listening, how do you find, are quilt frames still available and sort of... What sort of, how do you find one? I mean, I know that sounds ridiculous. I think like, isn't like the Grace Company had one, but they we discontinued it? Like, do you, can you get a, a frame now? I know that's a very ridiculous question. It's not at all a ridiculous question. I'm so happy you asked that, that question. Here's how you find it. I hope you have a pencil. I hope you're writing this down. Yeah. Uh, uh, you go to Amazon. Go to Amazon. Really? You can and, go to Amazon uh, and get a quote yes. frame? Hold on. Uh-huh. Go to Amazon and search for Joe Cunningham uh-huh. the, or search for the name of this uh, uh, basting and quilting in an old-fashioned frame. It's a DVD. Now, you'd have to find a way to play a DVD. Uh, <laughs> I realize that that's not easy nowadays. <laughs> but it's a DVD. So, and you can buy a disc drive or borrow one from your uncle or something. Yeah. I found it. And basting and quilting this... in an old-fashioned frame. I just found it. I found it. Oh, good. I went to Amazon and, and, I, and I found it. And what does it cost? Twenty. Twenty dollars or thirty yeah, dollars. Yeah, it's or- twenty-four ninety-five. Here we go. So uh, uh, it's a DVD, and it shows you uh, how to make a frame. It it'll cost you thirty bucks, and it'll take about you know a couple of hours with a screw gun and a saw. That's really it, interesting. It's the easiest thing in the world to make your own frame, uh, and um, so that's how you can find a frame. I love make it. Make it, and uh, and I give you all the instructions. Plus, in that DVD. I show how to use that frame for basting because oh, people really do the dumbest things when it comes to basting their quilts with uh, taping them to the floor and that sort of stuff. Baste it in a yeah. frame, man. You can put it in there and then it, it, it have a, a pleasant hour of basting your quilts instead of uh, – and everything's hold, held taut all the way through. Yeah, so I show not, how to baste in a frame and really I show the quilting – stitch yeah. so you i teach you my rocking stitch oh that's yeah. very cool okay we have to go we have to good. do that okay let me put that let me put the link in here so we have uh amazon good okay um okay cool so um uh let me just put the link in so that people can get to it i know it was really hard hitting journalism <laughs> So hold on just a That's second. right. That's right. <laughs> but it's super important. You some and I imagine like very kind of connecting to history in some way. Like like that's sort of how it's done. So that you feel like there's a kind of authenticity to building your own frame and and sort of doing it that way as opposed to trying to find a frame out there for whatever much. Well, cost. yes, that's yeah, I think that's correct. And in, and uh, to me, uh, what's fascinating about quilt frames is that they're, once again, we're extra academic, we're extracurricular. There's no uh, um, standard way to make frames. And it was the one way that men very often uh, got involved in, uh, even to a slight degree, in their wives' quilt making, was making uh, uh, frames for them, making the legs to stand well, before you know, I, have, on. I have to say that I see that still today. It's so interesting. First of yeah. all, um, yeah. the supportiveness of husbands, we, we haven't done enough, at least on my project on this, because we do see, um, husbands building things for their wives. Now it doesn't only really have to be husbands, partners or the non quilting part yeah. of the, the people or even the quilters right. themselves building things. But, but there's a kind of love of, you know, uh, you see this on Facebook, uh, you know, my usually husband, my husband, um, built me something for my thread and it's like the most magnificent thing. Yeah. Like it's really yeah. um a way to participate i think um and a way to sort yeah, of re- yeah. to um honor or sort of sort of say yes i i, I respect your your quiltingness and i'm making this uh-huh. for you you know yeah 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 it's cool. I think. okay let me give you another yeah. quote um when you saw the um the whole cloth quilt in G- um you said would you mind if a gu- some guy in san francisco made something similar and he kind of laughed um <laughs> Tell me yeah. about that moment and and that I think is the essence also of this intersection of uh, inspiration and mm-hmm. copyright, right? Like like there's a kind of funny and sort of also not just copyright, but 
norms of a community, of how far you can go. And then also we, you teach, so you're teaching techniques so I'm kind of under- uh-huh. I'm kind of curious about like why you said it that way and sort of your thoughts about sort of this mm-hmm. relationship between art and copying and individuality and all that. Well, uh, quilts uh, um, exploded in the mid 1800s in America for a number of reasons, but but one of the reasons is that there was no copyright, so uh, women. And uh, there was no casual photography either. So yeah. that if you uh, uh, went to Miss Lizzie's for a quilting or you went to the fair and you saw some quilts on display and you saw, oh, there's a pattern I would like to make. Uh, the, the way I understand it, uh, uh, women would very often go home and uh, use some handy scraps and uh, copy that block. Right. They would make a... Now, did you, version of it. In your in your study, did you also find? I would imagine that there was also on the flip side of that, um, if somebody well known or somebody in the community that made something incredible, that there was a kind of almost implicit territoriality of like you're not going to make your version and claim it as yours. Like, is, was there any kind of like I've just spent you know thousands of hours making this incredible thing and. You, uh-huh. you know, the, the concept of copying or sort of respecting others. Did you do you, do you find uh-huh. any of that in your work? Uh, I, I I have not. Uh, I, I don't uh, I don't see that. Uh, you don't. I mean, if even into the 20th century, it, uh, I'm thinking right now of the the bunch of quilters around uh, uh, the Kansas quilters. Where did they live? Uh, Charlotte Jane Whitehill uh-huh. and her cohort. Yeah. Uh, do you know them? They're, they're these fabulous uh, applique artists. Yeah. Uh, I can't even think of any of their names at the moment. Um, uh, you know, they all made these uh, uh, coxcomb quilts. These, uh, and there's a number of these uh, fantastic uh, wreaths. I can't even think of the name of it. Uh, but um, but you think the part of the copying. A, the process is that that was just always accepted. There wasn't a territoriality in the sense of like someone comes up with a technique or an idea and then other people start to use it and that that's just part of, that it's all kind of a communal, that's okay, that there's a communal aspect to borrowing. Uh, the, yes. And that quilts, uh, um, that, that's how they... Uh, that's how they grew, you yeah. know, that's, that's how, and, and, and because also when you do a copy, it, I mean, uh, there's no such thing yeah. as, uh, as two quilts that are exactly alike in the 19th century. Yeah. Uh, um, and it, you know, uh, 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 two red and white nine patches yeah. are going to be completely different because each person has a different sense of proportion. Each person has a different set of fabrics to work with and blah, 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 blah. They're all going to be different. And, uh, uh, so, okay. So, um, you're, so you're uh, freaking me at, yeah. you're, you're exploding my little copyright mind in a really cool way. So what you're saying oh, is that in some way we don't need copyright. Uh, let's put that aside because the individuality yeah. of each person sewing and doing it is going to be unique yeah. in itself. And because you're not mass producing it, there's not really a yeah. worry about that because, they're all individual works. And so that just t- sort of takes care right. of itself. So copyright uh, then to me um, is a, uh, uh, it's a commercial issue. It is. Right. It always has uh, been. It, it, yeah. it, it always has been a commercial issue. Yeah. And, and uh, when you, uh, and, and that's the glory of quilts of the, uh, the way they exploded in America they exploded because they were non-commercial. It was a gift. The, in the DNA of the American quilt, is it, it's fundamentally, it's in our brains, it's imprinted in our genes almost. In the DNA of the American quilt is the idea that it's a gift made by a woman for somebody that she loves or for charity. Yeah. So uh, this idea that it's a gift, it, then the first thing, that, that the, the first implication of this is that it doesn't matter what it looks like. Yeah. Uh, what it, so, so if you want to make a quilt for somebody and you buy a kit uh, and um, 
and, and make this kit quilt and give it to them. Well, there's no problem with that. It, it doesn't matter where the, the design came from. The idea is that you made it. You made this thing for somebody and you gave it to them. And they, they accept the message, which is, I love you, you know? So, and so, how, how does that translate yeah. to our world today where there is sort of this yeah. weirdness about like who who can you who, you know I, I hear it all the time right so sometimes it's yeah. you know yeah. they stole my pattern or you can can use my pattern but you can't sell my pattern or you yeah. can't make if you make the quilts you can't sell the quilts or like it's there's a lot of frenzy yeah. about copyright um yeah. how do you feel yeah. about that part of it <laughs> What makes you think I have feelings about it? <laughs> I don't know. You're not very opinionated, you know, and you're kind of shy about your opinions. <laughs> yeah, expressing my opinions. Uh, here, uh, here's the way I feel about it. Yeah. I, you know, what what has happened is that uh, quilts have become monetized, yeah. right? And yeah. so uh, 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 then we got to have rules and regulations about uh, uh, about all its intellectual property. Yeah. Well, um uh, and that grows up out of, uh, I mean, that's what's so interesting is it, it's growing up with the val- value of the quilts. It's part of that bicentennial is that commercialization, commodification, uh, sell a bunch yeah. of stuff to people thing. Right. That's part of that yeah. revival, I think. You know. Well, yeah. And people have the idea. Well, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I would sound, I, I have to be careful what I say. But for me, so, so let me just put it in my in personal terms. Yeah. Uh, to me, uh, I don't care if somebody copies my quilt. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, I, that, that doesn't bother me at least. You, uh, my quilts are a purely a, an expression of my personality and my, of, just like your quilts are, my, my quilts uh, express everything I've ever seen or heard or felt or imagined, you yeah. know? It all comes to play when I'm making a, an original quilt. Yeah. So uh, it, it, it's not to get all what you would call hooty booty about it, but uh, uh, it, then that gives my quilt. And if I, if I bring my whole self to it, yeah. it has an authenticity, I believe, that's uh, undeniable and that's, that it's imbued with a, with a, with an authenticity yeah. that if somebody tries to copy it, they're, they're not going to be successful in that. If people use the ideas that I, that I came up with, like for instance, for instance, uh, 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 15 years ago, I started making quilts with bias tape right. as the creating the line. Right. right? So the, uh, then um, quilt con 10 years later or 11 or 12 years after I start doing this has a thing called the bias tape challenge where you're, you're challenged to make a design uh, using yeah. bias tape. Well, uh, uh, I don't own bias tape. Yeah. I, I learned to you to make it and use it from my mentors and from c- using patterns and copying old quilts yeah. and making vines and stuff with them. So, uh, uh, uh I, I, I I don't know if I, I could have sought a copyright on my idea that you, yeah, you using couldn't. lines instead of right, right, and you can't. You know? I mean, it's a technique, so copyright doesn't protect a technique or an idea. I mean, that's why we have that's right, right, the impressionists, that's right? right? We have lots of movements that, of art because more than just that one artist can do it. Um, that's kind of important that's right. to the system. Um, that's right. So, so yeah, so I could even have feelings about it, yeah. which I don't. Which uh, uh, it's it's not. So, uh, which I don't care. Yeah. I, I, I'm thrilled to have people out there making designs with bias tape. That's the way I feel about it. Yeah. And uh, people call me sometimes and want to be able to, they say, hey, I took your class in Texas. Can I uh, teach it to my guild? Yeah. Well, yeah, you right. know, you can. Yeah. I, I appreciate it if you say that Joe Cunningham fought this up yeah. and uh, I'm teaching it to you now. But See, it, you're you so know, French. I, I think you're such, you're too- Frenchman. So that's that is the essence of the the, the as well that that this right of attribution is really important that you know naming your source and because our mm-hmm. our system doesn't care about that right like we don't have a mm-hmm. right of attribution I mean we have it in like state law or whatever but in the copyright system mm-hmm. we don't care as much about that um, but you do so I think that's yeah. really interesting you're very um, that's really interesting and and very much an mm. a, an artist's perspective of you know 
why you create, as opposed to like yeah. a publisher of books, right, which has a very different right, motive right. Um, for operating. All right, I have one more. We're already yeah. at an hour. I have uh, one more, and I want to go a little bit into the economics, if you're cool with it. So the other thing you said, which I thought was really interesting, was men in quilts are guests. Our guests. Mm-hmm. Tell me, you've yeah. done a lot of work on that side of it, and you've been a man mm-hmm. quilting for 40 years now. Mm-hmm. So tell me more about what your thoughts are about that. How do we understand men in quilting? I know that's a huge well, topic. There's a thousand different men, and they do lots of different things, yeah. and it's not a monolithic topic. But I just really liked that quote right. of men in quilts are guests. Well, here's what happened. <clears throat> in America, it was women that took up quilt making for some of the above reasons that we already talked about. And, but uh, primarily, the, the biggest revolutionary thought that women in America had, <clears throat> excuse me, was that um, uh, uh, they were going to make quilts as gifts instead of as commercial items. Yeah. In Europe, you know, quilts arose in the 1600s when uh, the tea traders started bringing back palimpsests from India. Uh, and uh, they could make money with this. They could buy them cheap in India and sell them dear in uh, uh, London. Well, then tailors in London started uh, figuring out how to make them. So the well-to-do could have these quilted bed coverings. But they were, whatever you, the, the way they got made, they were not made in in the home. They were made by, uh, you know, people that were in the, in the business. It was a commercial uh, venture to make a quilt because of the dumb amount of labor that it took. Yeah. It was a commercial venture. In America... It became what I just described, uh, a gift made by a woman for somebody that she loved. Yeah. Number one, uh, so, so it being a gift, uh, a very important thing about that means that it would escape the notice of men. Yeah. Men would leave it alone right. because and there's it no be money. Of, it's not part there's of no the, glory. Yeah, it's not part of the economic system because it's out, it there's lives no, outside of yeah. it, right? There's no, why would a man pay attention to it? Yeah. You can't make any money from it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's a gift made by a woman. So, it's, so uh, um, that defined all kinds of things. It opened all kinds of doors. Um, uh, it closed doors. It meant that they would remain forever extra academic, uh, that they would remain forever beneath uh, serious consideration yeah. because every woman can do it. Right. So why would I pay attention as a museum curator? Right. Why would I pay attention to quilts? When my grandma, my aunt gave me a quilt when I went to college. Right. Quilts are just, it's just ordinary women. They're not, anyway, so we have all this idea. So for a man to take up quilt making is uh, uh, freakish yeah. uh, because men, I'm a white man. I'm a Caucasian male. Right. That, mean, that puts me at the apex yeah. of the height of the power in, the, in our culture, right? right? That's right. For, for me to, uh, for a man to uh, take up uh, quilts is, uh, uh, it's, it's, from an animal point of view, it's shocking because you're stepping downward in the power structure, our, our traditional power structure of our culture. So uh, it's like you're sitting in the room with the guys watching the game on TV or the war movie or something. Yeah. <laughs> and you get up and you go across the hall and you go into the room where it's a bunch of women sitting around making things for each other, you know? And uh, uh, it's, it's shocking to people. I mean, truly, when I tell people, you know, it happens all, I travel a lot. And so I'm on the airplane and start talking. Oh, so you're going, uh, yeah, I'm going to work. Oh, what kind of work do you do? Well, here we go. You know, I'm going to have this discussion. <laughs> what kind of work do you do? Uh, uh, I'm a quilt artist. What? Right. What are you talking? What are you saying? What what yeah. what English words did you just use? <laughs> right. People don't understand it. Your words don't because, make and, sense. And you can, <laughs> right. they don't make sense because obviously I'm nobody's grandmother. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm old enough to be a grandmother, right. but I'm nobody's grandma. And, and so you you can hear them thinking, and they want to say, uh, I believe they want to say, well, that's funny. You don't look like a quilter, right. you know. Um, and so uh, that's what I mean. That uh, it's it's a uh, uh, it's a hard thing to do. And if you'll notice, I had been making quilts for over three months when I had the idea of becoming a professional, yeah. which I thought was very, very uh, uh, open-minded yeah. of me um, to, uh, to go into this woman's world, yeah. you know? 
So, I'm a former hippie. Right. Uh, so, uh, and I'm, I'm, st- I'm still essentially a hippie. I'm free thinking. I can, yeah. oh, it's a woman's world, so I don't care. I can right. do that. Huge. Uh, which I was very proud of myself for until Julie Silber, the, the historian, uh, pointed out to me, uh, uh, Joe, that's bullshit. She said, she said uh, uh, you're, you didn't, all you did was what women always do. What men always do when they go into a woman's realm is they professionalize it. They need a way to explain it to themselves, Interesting. Uh, what they're doing there. So if they're making money out of it, and you can see it. Yeah. When I tell people I'm a quilter and they find out, oh, uh, uh, you're making money at this? I mean, once I tell them I'm going to work, oh, you make money, then you can see they relax right. because they, now I understand right. why he makes quilts because he makes money at he it. He makes money at it. And if you, but if you don't, yeah, yeah Interesting. right. Interesting. Do you so feel like... There's also, it's millions, it's millions of women. Yeah. It's hundreds or a few thousand men. Yeah. How do you feel? Oh, gosh, I have mm-hmm. too many questions for you in over an hour. So um, yeah. I, I, I really like this exploring this, this topic because there's also this sense of, um, well, I mean, there's a lot to that topic. I mean, I guess we can move on, but it's interesting. How, what role, like how do you, let's talk a little bit about the economics. The people say, well, because you're going to work, how does sort of, if you don't mind, and you don't, we'd have to answer this part of it, mm-hmm. but like we've talked mm-hmm. to a number of people about sort of how do you make a living doing what you do? Like obviously a percentage mm-hmm. comes from teaching. You're not someone who's mm-hmm. made patterns. That's not something that you've chosen to do, I don't think, yeah. right? Yeah, um, right. You, and you, I imagine that you do people buy your quilts. Is that true? Like there's That's, sale, yes. a sale like in the art world. Um, so tell me a little bit more about the economic side of being an art quilter who's not focused on patterns. Um, and I don't think you have, have you created, maybe you have fabric lines. Do you do any of that side of it? No. No, right? So tell me, right. So tell me about your, that Uh, side of it for. Well, it's teaching. It's, 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 uh, teaching. I have my own quilt retreat I do every year and I've been teaching all over the country for many years. Right. The Joe Retreat, that's right. right. Um, uh, and I'm going to start uh, a, a, a quilting workshop here in San Francisco. Oh, nice. Um, so it's teaching is, uh, is the biggest part of it. And then, uh, but my quilts, you know, are eight or nine or 10,000 or 30,000 uh, for a big one um, dollars. And so if I can sell, uh, you know, Generally, I'll sell about three quilts a year, three or four, not a whole lot. I don't have an agent that's out there beating the bushes for me or anything. So if I can sell three or four quilts a year, um, then that's good. Yeah, and some, some years I sell more than that. Uh, and um, uh, so it's not the sort of thing that I get rich from. Uh, uh, I make, uh, to be frank about it, I make only about, I mean, about $1,000 a week. Uh, from making quilts mm-hmm. and, and teaching. Yeah. If you, uh, you know, I made some, or mm-hmm. a little bit more than that, I suppose, uh, throughout the year. So uh, um, I, I'm, I'm not getting rich from this, but, um, uh, but I get to, but I get to do it. And I'm, and I think as far as how much money I'm making uh, and it, yes, it's, it's teaching and quilt sales is where, my money has been coming from lately. Yeah. So that, um, uh, uh, it, I, I mean, I think for a, for an artist in America, I'm uh, I'm doing very You're well. Doing very I don't well. have any complaints about it. Now, how does yeah. how does the art world like? We understand you're like a big deal in the quilting world. Super excited to talk to you today. Mm-hmm. You're a big deal. Tell me yeah. about the art world. Yeah. How does the art world and how has that changed over time in terms of understanding quilts as art? Do you have... Well, you... Uh, so, uh, first off, let me just say, I, I have an appointment. I have people coming uh, uh, soon. Yes. So, the doorbell will ring and I'll... And I'll and that sounds great. I'll and I have, to, I have to take guests. a kid to school in just a few minutes, too. So, um, do you want to okay. just... Okay. Okay. So, here, but, yeah. so, here's what's happened. Yeah. Uh, I very confidently have predicted over the years that the one thing that would never happen is that a quilt would not be put on the walls of a museum uh, made by a contemporary person like me yeah the way you get on the walls of a museum is by being an exotic person amish quilts what do you know this little old lady somehow 
thought up a way to make quilts that looks like modern art. Right. It's unbelievable. <laughs> so there's this freakish element that people, uh, yes. you, you know, or geez, Ben. Right. So, so we have these exotic people right. that it's incomprehensible. They, and, and, you know, it's flattering to me as a sophisticated person to, to say, and they didn't even know what they were doing. And, but I can see how I can appreciate it for its rough beauty. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, so uh, it, it flatters people to put these exotic, these quilts by exotics on the walls of a museum once in a while. Yeah. You don't want to do that all the time, of course. Um, uh, but for art quilters to get on the wall of a museum, forget it. You could win Paducah, uh, Visions, Quilt National, Houston, whatever. All these prizes, and you take them all the, in a bushel basket and dump them out on a curator's desk, and they would go, "What the hell is this? What do I care? This is—I don't care what quilt contest you won. It has no context outside of this quilt ghetto that we live in, yeah. and so that we created because we had no choice. Uh, they wouldn't show our quilts. Yeah. So, uh, so um, I have confidently predicted that this is the way it will always be until the young people coming out of uh, art school and with their MFAs in art history and stuff become the ones in charge of the museums. Yeah. And then now the aesthetic is completely different. The idea of what can go on the walls of a museum is completely different than it used to be. When I was young, there was high art and low yeah. art. There was yeah. art, there was craft. There was still, Whole different thing. Yeah, when I went well, to now, grad school, that was still something that they were t teaching in you know the early 90s. It was like, you know... Yeah. High art, low art. It was yeah. like ridiculous. And now, if it's cool, yeah. it can go on the wall of my museum. If I think it's cool, up on the wall of the museum it goes. Yeah. So uh, just recently, uh, I saw a Facebook post. Somebody said that they were on vacation in San Francisco. Somebody else said, watch out, you might run into Cunningham. <laughs> and uh, this person said, uh, no, I haven't run into Cunningham, but I did see his quilt at the DeYoung Museum. So great. Uh, what in the world are you talking about? Well, uh, the de Young bought a quilt from me about 10 years ago. And uh, I I've, I've assumed it would always be in storage. Or else it would be shown in their textile gallery, right. you know, something like this. It's on the main, it's in the main gallery. It's huge. The quilt of mine that they own. Right. So uh, I think this is changing faster than I ever believed that it would. And I think for those reasons, it's changing. The, well, I mean, the whole idea. Yeah, I think that, mm -hmm. I mean, I know we're going to both be interrupted in just a second. So I just want to say that, like, this trajectory of who you are and what you've do done um, moves quilting along in such a significantly important way that this has just been an incredible um, time chatting with you. Because this is all oh. super important. Your, your blend of history and the artist and who you are. And your respect of how you, you talk about people and, and respect other artists um, is so very important to sort of what we are as, as quilters and as artists. Um, it's huge. Mm. And you're awesome. And well, we uh, didn't get all the things we didn't get to talk about. We didn't get to talk about all kinds of things. We got half, our, but we got to half the list. So I'm good. I'm happy about that. But we did not get to talk about the okay, ballad well, of Joe the Quilter. That was my, that's the only thing we <laughs> I've, I'd love to talk about the ballad of Joe the Quilter. Yeah. Uh, so anytime, okay, cool. uh, uh, get in touch and, uh, and I'll be happy to uh, we'll do, a do part this again. Two. It, it, that sounds great. I, I'm ready. Um, do you need to review okay. this before we post it? No, I don't think I said anything I'll regret nope, later. I don't think so either. You're amazing. You're amazing. Thank you so much for uh, such a nice time. Thank you for saying all of those nice things. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and it's, it's a, like I say, it's an honor this for is me so to great. be you. here talking with you. Thanks so much. All right. Have uh -huh. a good day. Okay. You too. Take care. Bye. So you've been listening to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. And I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gard. If you like this podcast, keep listening. Also, we have a Facebook group. Come join us. We talk about a lot of things. We also have an Instagram account. And of course, most importantly, I really hope you get a chance to quilt today. <laughs>